Hello, 2022. Welcome. I am Andy Panko, owner of Tenant Financial, uh, moderator slash host of uh, Taxes and Retirement. Thank you all for joining me. Happy New Year. Welcome to the first edition of Taxes and Retirement of uh, 2022. Super exciting. Um, let me just check comments, see if you all are able to see me. Give it a few seconds. So thanks for joining. We've got a, a slightly new uh, look and feel to things here. In case you didn't notice the uh, you know, new intro slide, music's still the same, but intro slide, um, change the banner of the Facebook group, just to try to refresh things a little bit, start things off uh, in, a, in a clean, new sort of, uh, sort of, sort of note. So um, fun fact, the last Taxes and Retirement Live of last year, December 15th, I think it was, uh, actually had COVID at the time. Did not know it. Well, I sort of knew it, but uh, so I was on a Wednesday. I, I had a cold. I thought it was a cold for a few days prior. Really just some congestion. Started to feel a little tired. That Wednesday um, definitely felt like something was slightly off. So anyway, I had took a rapid test before, uh, you know, right around dinner. That came back positive. Immediately went, got a PCR test. That was like uh, an hour or two before I went live on this thing. And uh, sure enough, came back the following morning that was positive. So uh, I knew I was sick. Didn't know I was, you know, I had COVID sick, but it wasn't that bad. Thankfully, I don't know if it's the Omicron virus, which is apparently, you know, much less severe and or my uh, three Pfizer shots that I can attribute my mild symptoms to. But for me, thankfully, it was really nothing more than a cold. And I did have a fever that Thursday, but um, it wasn't too high. And it was just that one day. My daughter got it as well, you know, a few days after me. Her symptoms were even milder than mine, but nonetheless, uh, you know, because of that and the the isolation periods around it, we we did have to skip out Christmas again from uh, for seeing family and friends. But we're both 100% now. My my wife and other daughters miraculously didn't get it, or if they did, we didn't know it because um, I was clearly very, uh, you know, well, not very sick, but I was sick and presumably contagious for the few days before I knew I had it. And uh, you know, we were all in and around each other in cars and home, whatever. So. Uh, anyway, so we had another COVID Christmas, hopefully uh, for, for my family, at least it's done and behind us, but but who knows? We'll, we'll see how the world progresses. That's all for that. Uh, again, thanks for joining. Let me start with the dad jokes, although the look and feel of the intro slide has changed, as has the uh, background banner of the group itself within Facebook. What hasn't changed is my affinity for corny dad jokes. So I got three kind of uh, wife themed ones. Conversation. She says, at least invite me out to dinner. He says, I don't go out with married women. She says, but I'm your wife. He says, I make no exceptions. Take that. Um, my wife thinks I don't give her enough privacy. At least that's what she said in her diary. And finally, hold on, let me, let me get my friend queued up here. Where'd he go? My sidekick. He's still here for 2022. I, I didn't give him the boot. I told my wife she should embrace her mistakes. She gave me a hug. <laughs> Yep, he's still here. He still has that corny hat or whatever that is. Um, okay, disclaimer. Oh, tonight's a mailbag. I forgot to mention mailbag. I do have a handful of uh, questions sent in, which I will go through. But prior to that, let me do the disclaimer, which also has the new look and feel. Uh, this video is only general explanations and education. It is not specific tax, legal, and investment advice. Before considering acting on anything you've seen in this video, first consult with your tax legal investment advisor, new edition. Thank you. That did not used to be my old side. Um, as always, I am I am not your legal tax investment advisor. I'm just some, some random guy on Facebook uh, answering questions to the best of my knowledge and ability. All right. Um, comments. Let me just see if there's anything here. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Oh, sorry. Jackie. COVID test is an eligible medical expense for your health savings account and flexible spending account. Uh, so everyone keep that in mind. I believe PPE, protective, I forget what it's called, man. PPE was such a, such a 2020 word. Personal protective equipment, I guess. Uh, that, that's a deductible medical expense as well. Masks, gloves, hand sanitizer, I assume. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, moving on. Thank you all. Thank you for this, for this input here, Jackie. It's, it's good to know. First question is from, uh, just got this tonight, uh, TW. First question, it's three-parter. First question, is it true that 401A contribution is on a separate bucket than 403B? Um, I believe so. I, I'm far from an expert in 401As. For those that don't know, it's another 
uh, employer-based retirement plan. It's specific to non, uh, you know, not-for-profit companies. I think like local government schools, charities can 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 use four hundred one a's. I don't know much about it. I'd seen one once in, in real life. Um, like I said, far from an expert. To my knowledge, yes, four hundred one a's do have a separate contribution limit. So four hundred one k's, four hundred three b's. Uh, TSP, if you're a federal employee, you can only put in what's it, uh, nineteen and a half thousand dollars next year, or, or no, it's higher. What is it, twenty and a half, twenty thousand? I don't even remember. Um, I should have twenty and a half. So, yeah, twenty and a half thousand dollars for twenty twenty two. You can uh, electively contribute either on a pre tax or Roth basis into a combination of four hundred one ks, four hundred three bs, TSPs. If you if you have different employers and you have those different plans. You, you can contribute to different plans, but your, your aggregate contributions, twenty and a half thousand dollars Or if you're 50, and a, uh, 50 or older, you can make an additional 6,500 contribution. Um, plus there's after-tax contributions you can make. So the total limit is it's like 61 grand um, between your elective deferrals and your after-tax contributions and employer contributions. But 401As, if you have one, so you work for a company that has a 401A and you work for a company that has a 401K, for example, uh, I do believe there's separate limits. I don't know what the limits are, um, or maybe uh, the they 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 share that combined sixty one thousand dollar limit, of which you know twenty and a half plus sixty five hundred catch up could be made through four hundred one k and the remainder through four hundred one a. I I really don't know. I did try to do some research quick, uh, couldn't find definitive answers fast enough. So, but but it does seem to be clear they are slightly separate uh, uh, contribution limits. Uh, TW. Next question from TW. What do you think will happen to backdoor Roth at the moment? I have no idea. Um, so, you know, th this question stems from the buzz in the Build Back Better bill, which was uh, 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 passed by the House in November, stalled out in the Senate. Senator Manchin, West Virginia, I think he's from, uh, put the kibosh on it, you know, kind of in the 11th hour. So as of now, it's kind of dead in the water. But not to say the bill won't be resurrected, uh, albeit in, in likely a different form, you know, with, with things added or deleted. So the the uh, notion of killing the backdoor Roth, which ultimately what they're killing is um, the ability to convert monies that were contributed to a tax deferred account on an after-tax basis, the ability to convert those to Roth is, is what will be taken away. And that's one of the uh, uh, two steps in doing a backdoor um, Roth uh, contribution. So uh, sure, it's, it's possible that that still gets killed this year. Um, I wouldn't doubt it happens at some point. It's clearly on the radar. Um, and frankly, anything that that's dubbed backdoor kind of has its day's number to start with, right? It's sort, it's sort of implied. Now, that's not a technical Congress term. That's what sort of the industry has decided to call this is the backdoor Roth contribution. Just the fact that it's called backdoor clearly means like, yeah, you know, we all think we're kind of getting something for nothing with this. So I wouldn't be surprised if it goes away. Um, third question from you related, TW, is if I jump into the backdoor Roth this month, uh, January, do you think the government will make us unwind once the law is passed? Again, who, who knows? So the question is, you, you do this backdoor contribution, which means you're, you're effectively doing a conversion of after-tax monies now in January. Let's assume in March, I'm just making up a date, uh, the bill does pass and it does include a uh, restriction on the ability to, to convert after-tax monies. My guess, and this is just a guess, is it'll be effective, I'm going to assume, you know, beginning of 2023. Not to say they can't make it effective immediately or even make it effective retroactively, in which case, sure, you'd have to unwind it. But practically speaking, I, 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 it's going to be an absolute nightmare for, for people, you know, uh, taxpayers and custodians alike to have to unwind all this stuff. So I highly doubt they'll make this retroactive if and when they do kill the backdoor Roth. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you, obviously, with certainty, don't worry about it. But I, I'd be really surprised if they make it retroactive and you and everyone else who does these backdoor contributions has to go ahead and unwind it. That's just going to be an absolute nightmare to, to process. So that's that. <clears throat> uh, good questions, TW. Thank you. Next, Rosie Johnson. Um, fairly long. Let's see if, I can, see if I can trim this down. How does one go about separating mixed pre-tax and post-tax traditional IRA? Several years ago, I started an IRA with pre-tax rollover from a previous employer. In the last few years, I added post-tax non-deductible contributions. Can I separate the account balance into the original pre-tax amount and post-tax contributions and pre-tax earnings? 
Can I move all the pre-tax and now completely out of this account to an employer-sponsored 403B, leaving only the post-tax basis in the account? Um, this is our only traditional IRA with mixed money. The others, a traditional IRA, a SEP IRA, uh, are all either are all only pre-tax or only post-tax. Can you offer any general wisdom on consolidating multiple IRAs? Okay, uh, great question, common question. So, uh, yes, and, and she does say in here, it, it appears her employer's 403B does indeed allow IRAs to be rolled in. So if you do, you or anyone have an IRA that has a mix of pre-tax money, which is either pre-tax contributions and or earnings, and after-tax contributions, there's no way to separate out the after-tax money from the pre-tax unless you have an employer plan, a non-IRA employer plan, like a 403B or 401k, that allows you to roll in IRAs. And the way this works is, by law, employer plans like 403Bs and 401ks cannot take in after-tax money from an IRA. They're only allowed to take in pre-tax money. So you have an IRA with, let's just say, $80,000 of pre-tax money and $20,000 of after-tax. You can roll in $80,000 of your IRA to your 403B. By default, it's only that $80,000 of pre-tax money because, again, 401ks, 403Bs cannot take in after-tax money. So in the process, you're effectively uh, sifting out, you know, the $20,000 of after-tax money stays behind on, in, your, in your IRA. Then at that point, you can convert that after-tax money to a Roth IRA, pay no tax on it because, uh, you know, it's after-tax money you're converting. So long as by you know as of december 31st of the year you do that conversion that none of your iras have any pre-tax money this plan works and there's no proration you mentioned in addition to this ira you have you have another ira and a sep ira this is going to be a pickle um the the proration thing looks at all of your iras in aggregate even though you have this one ira where you rolled out eighty thousand bucks of pre-tax money to your 403b and left behind 20 20 000 of after tax if and when you do a conversion you, you can't convert just that 20. it's going to look at the rest of your ira balances as well any other traditional iras sep iras simple iras so long story short unless you get all of the pre-tax money out of all of your flavors of iras out of IRAs into 403B in your case, um, no, you, you can't isolate just the after-tax money because it, it's going to look at all of your IRAs come December 31st when it's time to do this proration thing. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. So what, what could you do? Uh, in theory, you can take all of your various IRAs, including the SEP, roll them into one IRA. And then from that one IRA, move all your pre-tax money into your 403B, leaving behind just the after-tax and make sure as of December 31st, you don't roll back in or contribute in any other pre-tax money to any IRA because then you'll still be subject to proration. Uh, great question. Hopefully that answer made sense. Uh, thank you, Rosie Johnson. Next, another uh, multi-parter, Brenda Polby. Would someone who is 70 get any benefits from an FP? I assume you mean financial planner. Um, it depends. It depends what you're looking for, what you want, what you need. If your life is on autopilot such that uh, you have healthy social security and pension, for example, maybe you bought an annuity and the annuity stream is on, um, and those income payments more than cover your living expenses, and you know you, you don't have lots of other complexity in your financial life, you know maybe you got some portfolio, half a million bucks, million bucks, whatever it is that you really don't need because your guaranteed income is more than covering things. So you got this, let's just call it a million dollar portfolio um, that, that sure, it needs to be invested. Now you can do it yourself if you're, if you're willing and able and comfortable, that's fine. You can probably just dump it in some basic kind of target date retirement fund. This isn't specific investment advice. I'm just saying, you know, potential options that one may have. Um, so in that sense, if, if all you really want and need is someone to oversee your investments, it may not be worth paying someone to do that because they're probably going to overcomplicate it. They're probably going to charge more than, than what you actually need if all you need is someone to oversee investments because there's lots of good DIY options out there. Um, so in that case, no, you, you, you may not. Um, if, on the other hand, there is more going on in your financial life, if you are actively taking distributions from your portfolios um, because you need to, because you don't have enough Social Security pension, whatever, to cover things, if you have other things going on, like you're making charitable gifts, if you have estate planning you want to do, if... Um, you know, you're, you're uh, I don't know what else, you have potential health issues where you want someone to help be involved and, and help you make decisions about your life, either because you or your spouse or whomever, 
may not be willing or able to anymore, then then sure, then then it could make sense to have someone to work with to help kind of be your uh, partner and guide in helping you live your financial life and help you make decisions. So it, it really depends. Um, I'm not going to tell you you don't need one. I'm not going to tell you you do. There's lots of people, you know, seven year older who, who do have advisors slash planners and they probably don't regret that they do. There's others that that do and maybe question it, but just inertia you know, makes them think, well, you know, I've been with this person for 30 years, even though my life is kind of cruise control now, like, whatever, they're still here. They're still deducting their fee. I'm fine with it. So it all depends. Um, good question, though. Second question for Brenda Pulvey, is life insurance needed after you are retired? Why and how is it beneficial? Drum roll. It depends. Um, in many cases, the, the, you know, when you're, when you're retired, 60, 70, whatever it may be, no, you may not have a financial need. Let me rephrase it. Life insurance in the purest sense is that if and when you die, you, you your loved ones, your survivors may be in, in sort of, uh, you know, financial distress or financially worse, worse off or, um, you know, et cetera. That's what life insurance is for in the simplest sense. Typically, it's for people younger, working stages, building a family. If and when that person dies, you know, his or her income goes away, which means the family may not be making enough to pay off the mortgage, to pay for college, to pay for day-to-day -day living expenses. You know, then, yes, that person needs life insurance. When you're older, let's say you no longer have kids or dependents. Um, you're not working, so you don't have wages you need to worry about losing. You're already on Social Security. Maybe you have a pension. Maybe you have annuities. If you die, what's going to happen? And let's assume you have some investable portfolio. You die, what's going to happen? Does, does your spouse, or if you're not married, does you, you know your, your kids or your friends or whatever need a payout? You know, are they going to be financially burdened by you dying? Uh, maybe not, likely not. If that's the case, you don't absolutely need life insurance. But here's where things are complicated. Life insurance is, is often or can be a lot more than simply a death benefit if you die. I just, you know, see my post today I made in the group about that article I wrote about uh, cash value life insurance. It can do multiple other things beyond just paying a death benefit. So if you had, you know, decades ago, you, you bought this cash value life insurance policy that now has a really large cash value. No, you, you may not need the death benefit component of it, but maybe you got a few hundred thousand bucks in, in cash value built up. You, you may not want to just dump and unload the policy at this point because that cash value could still be growing at a potentially healthy interest rate. So maybe you keep it. Maybe that's that's a source of cash and, you know, loans and uh, cash flow flexibility when needed. But from a pure insuring the loss of your life perspective, no, a lot of people don't need life insurance. Now, a lot of retirees. Now, the story changes if, you know, depending what your legacy and wealth transfer goals are. If you want to, uh, when you die, have a lot of money tax-free, go to some heirs or beneficiaries, there's, there's uh, you know, life insurance is a great way to do that, right? If you have, you pay premium, you get a few hundred thousand dollars of whole life insurance or something. When you die, that few hundred thousand dollars all goes tax-free to whoever gets it. So if one of your goals is to ensure you leave at least X amount of dollars for someone and on a tax-free basis, then you still may want to have life insurance. So do you need it? It's tough to say. Everyone's situation is going to be different. Um, but generally speaking, uh, and in my view and from what I see, the, the need to have a financial payout to someone due to your death is, is less important or is less disruptive or less dangerous, I should say, to the people you leave behind at that point. Because again, your wage has already stopped. Uh, you know, you may not have to ch children anymore that, that depend on you. Um, hopefully that that helped uh, answer the question. And three, is there a big fear in the market with all the boomers retiring and pulling money out of the markets? I don't think so. I think it's actually the opposite. Well, uh, who knows? We're, we're in sort of uh, un unprecedented territory, I should say, with the baby boom generation, you know, 10,000 people a day turning 65. I think it was the most recent statistic. And, and yes, they a, a, lot, a lot of them will be living off their portfolios, therefore selling stuff in their portfolios. But it, they're not all stock. You know, if you're already in or near retirement, you shouldn't have 100. Most people shouldn't have 100 percent of their portfolio in stock. A large part should be less glamorous things, bonds, whatever, um, where the you know, prices aren't going to be hurt as much by by selling them. And even with stocks, I, I don't want to say retiring boomers pulling distributions out of their portfolio can't move the needle. But I, I, I don't think it's a concern. If anything, I think the boomers as a whole 
have a lot more money than they need. I, I think you you can easily find more stories and data about uh, this massive wealth transfer that's going to be underway as opposed to the massive sell-off in equities due to boomers retiring. So the wealth transfer is boomers have accumulated a lot on, you know, as a whole, on average, everyone's story is obviously different, but boomers have accumulated a lot. They're not going to spend through all their money collectively, which means a lot of money is going to be left and handed down to, you know, Gen Y, Gen X or Gen X, Gen Y. Um, anyway, long way of saying, no, I, I don't think there's any fear of boomers retiring, taking distributions and roiling the markets. Uh, markets may be roiled, but but for other reasons. Uh, good questions. Um, next to last. Okay. June Lee, question about LIFO, FIFO, et cetera. So I have a website I found here. So June's question is um, in reference to when you when you sell a security, a stock, a bond, a mutual fund, an ETF, whatever, in one of your accounts, namely your taxable brokerage account, uh, is where this matters most, you can specify the the uh sale lot method uh or cost method it all depends different people call it different things cost basis method of what you want to sell so for example let's assume you have 10 shares of something and you want to sell three of them or four of them or whatever not the whole 10 and let's assume you bought one share per year over the last 10 years you bought them at different prices at different times how do you know when you sell these three shares which three you're going to sell of those 10 well, there's different options and, and you have to specify to the broker which option you want when, when you make the sale. So let me pull up a site here. Um, uh, so this is from, and I just Google to find it instead of me writing the stuff out myself, Dodge and Cox. I'm not promoting them. I'm not endorsing them. Just simply they, they had the cleanest, best looking table of, uh, although it looks a little dated aesthetically, but whatever, <laughs> the, the, the info itself is one of the clearest descriptions I found. So um, here's the different different cost base cost basis methods available. You can sell things at average cost. So you own 10 shares. Again, you bought those 10 shares at different times, all at different costs. You can have them sold. You can sell your three shares at the average cost of your 10 shares. That's average cost method. More commonly, it's usually going to be either FIFO or LIFO, first in, first out, or last in, first out. First in, first out simply means the shares that you're selling are the one are the oldest, the ones you bought first. So in our case, you own 10 shares, you bought one share per year for 10 years. If you sell three of them, you're selling shares you bought 10, nine, and eight years ago. The opposite of that is LIFO, last in, first out. Simply put, you're, 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 if you're selling, again, in our example, these 10 shares, you're selling the shares you bought this year, last year, and the year before that. The last in are the first out when you sell them. There's HIFO, high cost, uh, first out. Those are simply those that have the highest basis, the highest original purchase price is uh, the, the, the ones that you're going to sell. You do this if you want to uh, maximize your taxable gains, for example. You know, take the ones that have the highest cost. No, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. Uh, minimize your, um, your taxable gains. The ones that have the highest cost, you sell off first. So to minimize the uh, taxable gain you have. Or the opposite, LOFO, low cost first out. You're going to sell the three shares that have the lowest original cost, thereby maximizing the uh, amount of taxable gain you're going to realize. Loss gain, <clears throat> loss gain utilization is basically leaving it up to uh, the the uh, custodian to, to, to mine through the prices and say, sell the ones that will give me the largest loss if, if there are things that have losses at the time. Um, so that would basically be, you know, the, uh, the I guess it's kind of the same as LOFO, low cost first out, but specifically those that have losses. And specific lot identification, this is you specify, you say, hey, uh, sell the share I bought in 2015, sell the one I bought in 2016, and sell the one I bought in 2019. So you can do that as well. So those are your options. Um, I didn't realize how small this was. If, if June, if you see this or anyone else who wants to screenshot this or just you know Google it, this is Dodge and Cox. I found this at, again, I'm not endorsing them. Just I, I like the info they had. Um, here's the different uh, cost basis methodologies you can choose June. And final question, which is another kind of multi-part. Eric Stallworth, uh, what's your opinion of investing in bonds versus bond index funds? And a follow-on, someone else, I don't recall who, but asked um, about uh, actively managed bond funds. So, man, this could be a long one. Um, I, I did a video on this. I don't remember when, but uh, at some point last year, I think all about bonds and bond funds. It's on my YouTube channel. Check that out. That'll give a, a lot more background. 
but generally I lean toward bond funds. Easier to diversify, cheaper. Um, let me start with bonds, actually. So when you buy individual bonds, you can tailor the maturity of the bond to stop when you want. So if, if you know you're going to need, and this is called laddering in, in some circles, if you know, for example, you're going to need $100,000 of cash to spend next year, you can buy a bond today that matures in one year and, and has a $100,000 principal amount, which means in, a, in one year, it'll, it'll pay you, it'll redeem you, you know, $100,000. And between now and then, you'll get interest. The interest is going to be a joke. You know, on a, on a one-year bond, the interest is going to be well under a percent at this point, depending on what type of bond it is. But, um, you know, it's going to be a, a fraction of a percent probably. But you don't have to worry about the price of that bond moving. The price will fluctuate between now and when it matures in a year, but that doesn't matter. If you hold it to maturity, you will get back your $100,000 unless the issuer goes bankrupt and defaults, in which case you may get back less than $100,000. But barring a default, you will get back $100,000. You don't have to worry about the bond price moving along the way, which it will, because it will move and it'll eventually revert to, it'll, it'll hone in on uh, its, its face value when the bond matures. That, that's the upside. That's the positive of bonds. But the, the downside is that's one individual bond, right? You may have a lot of credit risk if you, if you pick bonds from just one issuer. Um, you, you probably want to diversify. So now if you start buying five, six, 10, 20 bonds, it's going to be hard to do. You know, researching individual bonds is a lot of work, which a lot of people don't know a lot about bonds. Buying individual bonds isn't going to be cheap. I don't know of any places other than maybe through Treasury Direct where you can buy bonds. You know, you buy bonds through a broker. There's going to be a trading fee, a commission anywhere from 10 to 50 bucks probably to buy an individual bond. So it's going to be clunky and annoying to do that. Um, with bond funds, bond fund is, is literally just it's a fund that owns hundreds if not thousands of bonds and they can be diversified across treasuries versus corporates versus municipals versus mortgage-backed bonds by different maturities by different uh, credit ratings and credit strengths so you can buy an index of bonds that has whatever flavor of bonds you want the upside is if you you know you buy it through like an etf or something there's no trading commission to do it the expense ratio is going to be you know, a fraction of a percent, typically 0.0 something percent, depending you know, which provider you use, if it's an index-based uh, provider. Um, the downside is there is no specific maturity. So if you're trying to match up um, you know, in, in one year, I want $100,000 redeemed, you're going to have to simply sell out of $100,000 of that bond fund in one year. Price changes do matter with bond funds. Unlike the individual bond example, where, where you don't care what happens to the price because you know you're getting 100,000 back, when you sell a bond fund, there, there will be price fluctuations. Maybe the price of the fund is higher, maybe it's lower in a year, you don't know. So there is some, some interest rate risk, some price risk with bond funds. That's the downside compared to individual bonds where you don't have to worry about that. Now there is uh, there are some bond um, fund providers that have something called bullet shares is one of them. There's also one called I-bonds, I think. It's an ETF. It's a bond fund. So it's a it's a pooled investment made up of hundreds or, or potentially thousands of individual bonds, all of which mature at the same point. So you can buy this bullet fund that uh, it all matures in a year. So you buy the fund today, you get redeemed out in one year and, and you get your hundred grand back or however much you put in. And you can buy one that matures in 2023 or 2024 or 2025. So that's another option. Fees are a little higher with those, I think. Um, you don't have a lot of timing when you have when, when you get the money. I think in bullet shares, for example, they they do their distribution in December, so which may not help if you want money in June, let's say. So it's not quite that flexible, but it is potentially a happy middle ground of messing around with a collection of individual bonds and doing a bond fund. Bullet shares kind of sit in the middle where you can stagger your your your, your shares uh, based on what particular maturity year you want. Um, I can go on forever about this. Let me try to wrap this up. F final point about actively managers passive. Uh, sure, maybe actively managed bond funds could, per, could could return better than just passive index based bond funds. Um, my view on active versus passive, when it comes to large, well traffic, well covered, heavily researched, lots of market participant things like large cap U.S. equities, there's virtually no value in trying to use an actively managed fund, hoping that the fund manager can outperform the broader market. The, the, the fund manager has no information, in my opinion, no information edge 
no trading edge, whatever. Y you can't beat a market that's as liquid, as many participants, as research, as large cap U.S. equities. So don't bother trying. In that case, just use passive index funds. Sure, active managed funds can get lucky. They can have good years or a string of years where they beat the average. But overall, loads of research show that actively managed equity funds simply do not keep up with passive alternatives, especially when you factor in the fee, the higher fee of actively managed. So where I'm going with this, the, the less traffic, the more esoteric, the, the less buyers and sellers there are for given securities, then active management makes more sense and does provide uh, actual tangible value. One extreme in my, in my prior 20 years of doing this, I worked in uh, alternative investments, hedge funds, private equity funds. I saw lots of crazy strategies. You know, there, there's distressed funds that invest in Lehman's, Lehman bankruptcy claims, for example. So Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. Um, people who are creditors to Lehman don't want to sit for years or a decade to potentially get their money back from Lehman bankruptcy. But nonetheless, they have a claim on the Lehman bankruptcy estate. They want out. Someone will step in. Hedge funds will step in and say, hey, I, I'll buy your claim for whatever, 20 cents on the dollar. There's an active market to trade these things. That definitely needs active management where people know the process well, they know the court system, they know the Lehman bankruptcy inside and out. There you need active management. You're not going to find a passive fund that will invest or invest well in things as esoteric and off the beaten path as Lehman bankruptcy claims. I've also seen strategies that uh, focus on aircraft leases and aircraft engines, buying and selling aircraft engines in the secondary market. You need active management there for people who know the stuff, who can research it and whatever. Bonds lay, lay somewhere in between. They're much closer to stocks than they are these weird off the beaten path things I just mentioned, but not quite as much market participation, not many people buying and selling, not as many researching and following it. So there is potentially a bit of an edge to be had with active management of bond funds as opposed to large cap equity funds. But I'm not convinced that that edge is always going to be sustainable and always there. My, my focus is control what you can control. You can control fees. You can control diversification. You can control simplification. To some extent, you control, you control your allocation. To some extent, you can control the taxability of your investments, meaning which funds, which positions go in which account type. You can't control which sector, which bond type, which whatever is going to outperform you know, one versus the other. So, so don't, don't try. At least that's my approach. Different people have different views. Uh, so not to poo-poo um, active managed bond funds. I think there's much more of a case to be made for active managed bond funds than there are active managed large cap equity funds. Um, but but I, I'm still not in that camp where, where I use them. So I'll, I'll leave it there. All right, man, that was a quick 33 minutes. Um, hopefully you all found these questions and answers helpful. Let me get a drink here and I will move on for the rest of the questions. Let me let me mute my drinking. Mm -hmm. All right, going to the top. What do we got? Some happy New Year's, bunch of happy New Year's. Uh, oh, oh. Um, okay, this is Bob using Sharon's Facebook account. Hi, Bob. Hi, Sharon. Is there a good video on YouTube or other source explaining how to fill out Form 2210 to verify the underpayment penalty that is appearing on TurboTax? Thanks. Um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, look at the instructions to form 2210. That's ultimately the source of how to fill it out line by line or just, just Google. I assume there are videos out there. I don't know for a fact, but uh, I, I don't have one, nor am I aware of any. Start at the instructions. If they're overwhelming, then try to find videos. But usually the IRS instructions are actually fairly well written and straightforward enough, uh, in, uh, in my opinion. Mark Troutman, in response to 401A, his wife had a 401A in municipal government she worked at. It was identical to 401K. She also had a 457 where she could similarly contribute. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, David Fultz with some extra info about 401As. Thank you. Okay. What's this? Cur curious, Andy. When you were an adjunct professor, did you teach the financial planning case studies capstone class? If so, did you use a real client? Uh, so so I, I was an adjunct finance professor at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Um, I say was because I wasn't full time. I was sort of like a semester by semester. I think I taught five or six semesters most recently, spring of 2020, which was a hoot because that was when COVID happened and, uh, you know, I had to go remote. Um, but anyway, no, I did, I did not do personal finance. It was all traditional sort of corporate finance and investments. I did a fixed income class, uh, an equities class. 
the corporate finance class and international finance class, but it, it wasn't the sort of personal financial planning stuff. Um, but case studies it will be cool. They'd be better with, with real scenarios. So hopefully, uh, you know, you, you can get some real scenarios in front of you and learn a lot from it. Can you touch on UGMA UPMA accounts with the broker and what the tax implications are for the custodian and minor throughout the lifespan of the account? Um, I, I not entirely sure. So UGMA stands for Uniform Gift to Minors Act and UPMA stands for Uniform Transfer to Minors Act. These are ways to open accounts for minors and uh, basically give money to them while you act as the custodian, you, know, you as the adult or the, 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 uh, the uh, guardian or whatever, the parent act as the custodian. Um, I, I forget which one, one, one of UGMA or UGMA kind of took over the other. The other one fell out of fashion. I think, I think UGMA might be the one that's sort of won out over time and UGMAs have kind of gone away or maybe I got it backwards. Um, tax wise, I don't, I, I don't really know, frankly. Um, I, I believe it's ultimately the, the kid's income so the G in UGMA stands for gift, uniform gift to minors. You, you, give, gift, you give money to your, your kids and put it in an account in their name while, while you're the custodian, while they're still a minor. Therefore, all the income and gains, I believe, are technically theirs, which means uh, depending how much income they have, they may need to file a tax return. And if they have more than a few thousand bucks of unearned income, such as dividends, interest, or capital gains, they may be hit with what's called the kitty tax, where their tax rate on those those sources of income will be taxed at your, you know, the, the, the parents, uh, tax rates. Um, once they're, once they're a minor or of age or whatever the, the formal cutoff is, I'm not sure what happens then. Then I think it's still their, their account, just the same and, and taxed to them since now they're, you know, they're now adults, but I'm not entirely sure. That's just my, uh, my guess. I'm frankly not too familiar with UGMAs and UGMAs. Pros and cons to have your adult children manage your portfolio. Um, I guess there's lots pros, presumably you can trust them and they're not going to do you over though. There are lots of stories of kids, unfortunately hoodwinking and taking advantage of the parents. So that could be a con as well. Uh, pro if they know what they're doing, sure. They can hopefully do it for maybe not better, but cheaper th than paying someone else con. If they don't know what they're doing, they can, they can, you know, mess you up, uh, as opposed to working with a professional who, who does hopefully know what he or she's doing better. Um, those are kind of the big ones. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's others, but uh, those are the first few that come to mind. If a scholarship is from a private company, not an employee of the company, to cover expenses related to obtaining a credential like certified financial planner, is it taxable? My understanding is that it would be taxable because it's not in the pursuit of a college degree. Uh, I don't know. That's a good one. Not an employee. Um, I, I really don't know. I'm, I'm not, because of the clients I work with and, and the stage of life they're in, college-related things, you know, education-related things are rarely um, on the docket. So I'm, I'm not that well-versed in all this stuff. So I really don't know. Um, my guess is it would be taxable, but I, I don't know. Sorry, Jackie. Is only the cash value portion of a life insurance tax free or the whole amount? Great question. So when you die, the amount that gets paid out to your designated beneficiaries, that's all tax free to them. Um, it's included, depending how it's structured, the death benefit paid, let's assume you got a $2 million term policy and you die. That $2 million is included in your estate and may potentially be subject to a state tax, although the state tax limit is really high. It's, what is it, 12,000 bucks or something this year for a person. Um, but th th that aside, the person who gets that $2 million is completely tax-free to him or her. What they do with it is a different story. If they invest it and it makes money, then they got to pay tax on those gains. But the, the receipt of that $2 million is completely tax-free to, to them. You, while you're alive, if you have a cash value policy, he here's, here's the rub with, with cash value. The, the big feature and selling point is you can build up a lot of cash value over the decades if you put money into this while you're working in retirement you got potentially this big pot of cash value you can use it for cash flow now you don't ever really take the money out that's not how this is structured and intended to be and it's not how it's pitched from the people who sell it you take loans against it loans are, are a form of debt a form of borrowing no form of debt or borrowing is taxable income because it's not income it's a loan 
So when you take a loan against this cash value, that loan isn't income because it's not actually your money. You're, you're, you're literally getting a personal loan from the insurance company where that loan is collateralized by the amount of cash value you have. You are not actually taking cash value out of the account. So if you do it that way, those loan proceeds are not taxable when you take them. But worst case scenario, the policy lapses for whatever host of reasons it may lapse. If you have a loan outstanding, that loan is all, is all considered a distribution. To the extent that distribution is larger than the amount of money you paid into the policy, the difference is taxable as ordinary income. And even if you do actually take cash value out, not a loan, but you, you surrender the policy, take cash value out, any cash value you take out above and beyond the amount of premium you paid in will be taxable as ordinary income. If you take out less than what you paid in, it's not taxed because because it's simply a return of your principal, and you're getting out less than you paid in, so you're not tax they're not taxing you. Actually, lost money on it from that perspective. So there's no taxable uh, there's no taxable gain, but there's no no tax reduction either. It's not like it's a deductible loss like it is if you have a loss in a security in a brokerage account. So um, anyway. Seemingly simple question, but there's a lot of potential what ifs, depending what aspect of cash value and or you know the death proceeds that, that you're talking about here. Karen, I read in your insurance article that you have several insurance policies. About 11 years ago, I bought a whole life insurance policy for my son, thinking it would be a good way to save for college. That's how it's promoted. I only have one more year of contributions. The cash value is about 25,000. I also had 11,000 of dividends that I withdrew. Do you think it would be best to borrow against the T's for college or leave it to grow for my son when he is an adult? Sorry for the long question. Uh, great question, but I, I cannot get into an answer. This, this uh, crosses the line of uh, me giving advice. So I can't say what you should do with the policy. Clearly, you know the options. You can keep it. You can take loans against it. You can surrender it and walk away, You know, take your ball and go home. As far as what's best, um, I, I, I don't know, first of all, but even if I did, I, you know, I wouldn't be able to say in a public forum. Uh, sorry, I appreciate the question though. Your thoughts on in stopping reinvestment interest on gains and your thoughts on stopping reinvestment interest on, and gains. Hubby is seven years old and we have enough retirement income to live on. Um, uh, it depends. So I have clients where they are actively distributing money from their portfolios, given the stage of life they're in. Um, for example, in their taxable brokerage accounts, we have turned off reinvestment of dividends, interest, and capital gain distributions because they are you know, pulling money out of the accounts. And so why do we turn it off? So when, when funds in a taxable account pay dividends or interest or capital gains, it's taxable regardless. Whether you reinvest it or take it out, it's taxed. You can't avoid that. But what you can avoid is reinvesting the money, having it grow more, and then having to sell some a few months later to take it out for distribution, then having to pay tax on it. So we decided what's best for this client is in the taxable account to turn off reinvestment of all such you know, sources of income. But IRAs, Roth IRAs, we, we still have reinvestment on because there's no tax implications to uh, getting those reinvested or when you do have to sell something, there's no tax implications. So it really all depends. Um, you know, if, if your money, if you're not going to need it, if your money's going to end up going to kids or whomever and you want it to keep growing, then sure, keep pumping the money back in through through reinvestment to grow it, not for you, but for whoever ultimately ends up getting your money. If it's just for you and you don't particularly need the money, so why put it at risk? You know, why reinvest it? Uh, and you have enough that you're there's, you know, negligible chance of you running out. Sure, you can, you can turn it off reinvestment if you want. So uh, again, I, I can't, I don't know, I can't say what the right answer is for you, but definitely it could make sense to turn off the auto reinvestment of dividends, interest and capital gain distributions. I assume this was in response to the cash value life insurance thing. So yeah, again, the death benefits fully tax-free, the use of cash value while you're alive depends how you use it may or may not be tax-free. Typically is if you use it as intended, but if not, you can pay tax on it. Speaking of cost basis, do you have to have a single method for the whole year? No, you do not. You, you can, each, each sale you do, you can choose individual. I, I guess each broker is different. Um, clients I work with, I have them custody at TD, soon to be Schwab. Um, we, we can choose for each sale the, the method we want to sell for that, uh, for that particular sale. But I suppose different brokers have different rules. Thank you, Dave Fultz. Here's the uh, replay of the YouTube, uh, the live I did about bonds. Ed, regarding bonds versus bond funds, I've been looking at target maturity bond funds. They seem to have the advantages of both individual. Yeah, so I think this is what I mentioned. Um, again, I'm not promoting or endorsing any particular provider, but I, um, 
Bullet Shares is one provider that does these bond funds where all the bonds mature at one point in time, you know, at the end of 2022, at the end of 2023. So you can pick and choose the maturities to tailor them to your, uh, you know, your, your cash flow needs. Um, the other one is, I think, called I, I Bonds, I believe. And I, I don't know which provider you're talking about here, Ed, but, but sure, functionally, probably the same thing. So, yeah, they're, they're not necessarily bad or good. Depends what you want out of them. If, if you want a regimented, um, you know, a regimented uh, uh, schedule of redeeming maturing bonds, if you want to build a ladder, if you will, that's what's called in industry, where you know with certainty in one year, you got 100 grand coming in. In two years, you got 200 grand coming in. In three years, you got 300 grand coming in. That could work. Um, what, what you gain in consistency and certainty, you, you potentially give up in uh, additional growth. Because like, like I mentioned before, bonds that have a one-year maturity, especially if they're things like treasury bonds that are really low risk, the interest is going to be like, I don't know. I don't know what it is now. Uh, maybe a quarter of a percent, give or take a little bit. That's not a lot. Now, granted, you're not you're not shooting for a lot of interest on this stuff. You're just shooting for stability and certainty. But nonetheless, that, that's kind of the risk you run. The, the opportunity cost of locking up your money for one years, two years, three years, four years, five years, whatever ladder you want to build, um, you know, you, you're giving up the ability to potentially earn some more. Uh, along the way, but not saying it's right or wrong. It's just something to keep in mind when uh, using products like this or building a bond ladder of individual bonds. Uh, vit, 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 vit. Do retirement investments follow the same rules as non-investment funds that after you sell a fund, you cannot purchase those same funds during the next 30 days? So you're referring to the wash sale. Um, it depends. So if you're only buying and selling within IRAs, Roth IRAs, HSAs, 401ks, no, it doesn't matter. You can have a loss on something you sell and the next day you can go buy it again, you know, in your IRA or whatever, assuming all this stuff happens, you know, these purchases and sales are in IRAs, Roth IRAs, whatever. The only time loss sale comes into play is with a taxable brokerage account. And why it matters is if you sell something in a taxable brokerage account at a, at a loss, you could potentially deduct, you can get a tax benefit from that loss. So the IRS doesn't want you then 30 days before that sale or 30 days after rebuying that same security or a substantially identical security. Uh, if you do, it'll be deemed a wash sale, in which case you cannot deduct the loss that year. Instead, the loss is tacked on to the basis of the new thing that you purchased. Now, here's where here's where I'm, I said it depends. So if you sell uh, stock XYZ in your brokerage account for a loss today, and within 30 days, if you rebuy stock XYZ in your IRA, that will still be deemed a wash sale. You, you will disallow yourself the ability to deduct that loss from selling your brokerage account because you bought it in your Roth IRA. Make sense? Um, let, let, let's flip the script. Let's assume you sold something at a loss in your IRA. And within 30 days, you rebuy that same thing in your taxable brokerage account. Is that okay? Yes, it is. Because it's the, the loss has to happen in your taxable brokerage account for a wash sale to come into play. If you have a gain in your tax brokerage account, you don't have to worry about this stuff. You know, there, there's no wash sale from related to that transaction, unless you sold that same security in that brokerage account 30 days before or after. But uh, anyway, hope that, hope that managed, hope that uh, helped. Ooh, what's the difference between active managed funds and hedge funds? Oh man, I thought about, give me a second here. I actually thought about doing, and I still may, Alive all about hedge funds. Not that I think most of you will care, but I spent the better part of 20 years working in, in, in alternative investments like hedge funds. Uh, I know them. I, I uh, have a, have a, have a uh, what's the word? Um, soft spot in my heart for them. I don't use them, but uh, I, I like them. They're interesting. Anyway, um, so I thought about doing like an educational piece all about hedge funds just kind of for the fun of it. I still may. But anyway, um, active managed funds is just simplest. It can mean a lot of things. Um, there's active versus passive. Passive simply means the fund invests in a bunch of securities to try to replicate some index. There's no person behind the scenes picking and choosing. I think this stock's going to do better than that stock or this bond's going to do better than that bond. They simply construct the portfolio to replicate as best as possible some predefined index. That's it. There's not a lot of personal discretion from the managers that go into play. Versus active. Active means there is someone consciously saying, no, I think... This sector is going to be better than this one, so let me buy more of this sector. Or you know, this stock's going to be better than that stock. I'll buy more of that, and I'll go short this one. That's active. You can have active or passive in in mutual funds, 
or hedge funds. Now, generally speaking, hedge funds are almost always active. I, I don't know of any passive funds. I guess there could be, um, but I never came across any. So what is a hedge fund exactly? A hedge fund, uh, I mean, I can take an hour on this, which I'll be, be short. It's a pooled investment vehicle, loosely similar to a mutual fund, and that a bunch of people put their money together into a pot. That pot is then used to buy a bunch of investments. All the people that put money in all own a prorated share of that pot and the economics of said pot. But a hedge fund is not regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, you can't buy a hedge fund through E-Trade. You, know, you can't buy it. They don't trade on an exchange. You have to be a qualified accredited investor because it is a private investment. Um, there's restrictions almost always restrictions around how much money you can take out and when the managers behind it in effect have carte blanche to invest in whatever they want majority of hedge funds are what's called equity long short they they buy and sell stocks and bonds they think are going to do better or worse than others but there's some real funky stuff out there in 2006 uh there was a, i worked at a place that was working on a transaction where there's a hedge fund trying to buy the rights to Nirvana's music catalog. So, so Courtney Love, you know, Kurt Cobain, who was a singer and founder of Nirvana, killed himself in 92 or 93. Um, she owned the rights to Nirvana's music catalog. She was selling them and she was trying to monetize it. Good for her. And so what was going to happen, this hedge fund was looking to buy the rights to this Nirvana catalog. They would then monetize it by basically, um, you know, letting car commercials use it and they'd get royalties from, from that. So they would monetize that catalog. That, that was an investment. That could be an investment. Hedge funds can invest in stuff like that. You can't. A mutual fund can't. Um, so hedge funds get you access to private, potentially cool, potentially funky, potentially lucrative, potentially very risky stuff like that. So that's what a hedge fund. Um, unregulated restrictions around who can invest, how much money you can take out and when. Uh, there's usually a predefined strategy of what they'll invest in, but ultimately they, they you can have a hedge fund that, that can invest in whatever, all sorts of crazy cockamamie strategies. So that's, a, and they're always actively managed. I don't think there's any passively managed. If there was, there wouldn't be a lot of reason to do it. Just go buy a mutual fund or ETF. It's a lot cheaper and easier. Um, okay. Alan Thomas drove me to drink. It's water. Staying clean. I'm high on life. Um, <clears throat> I had a large boost in income this year. I'm using the safe harbor rule to keep from penalties. I hope. When would it not be sufficient? My income is approximately 10 times last year. Oh. Uh, huh. One extreme. Let's assume you had zero tax obligation last year. Not what you owed with your return, but for the year, your, your total tax obligation was zero. Um, your safe harbor is such that you don't have to pay any taxes, uh, withholdings or estimated taxes during the year. You can pay it all with your return and not have any underpayment penalty because last year's tax obligation was zero. So Safe Harbor says as long as you pay 100% of last year's tax obligation, you won't have, you know, during the year, you won't have any underpayment penalties. Well, 100% of zero is still zero. So even if you have $2 million of income this year, if you had zero tax obligation last year, you do not have to make any estimated uh, payments or withholdings this year, you can pay it all with your tax return and have no underpayment penalties. That's federal. Your state may be different. So check with your state. Uh, you know, I don't know what state you're in. They may have different safe harbor rules. Um, so with that said, I, you know, when wouldn't, when is it not sufficient? Well, if you don't withhold or pay enough estimated taxes to meet the safe harbor, depending on what your safe harbor amount is again, based on last year's income. Um, Agma Utma, scholarships are taxable. Thank you. Whoever this is. Bit, 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 fit. What? How did this come up again? I'm oh, sorry. Okay, never mind. Um, where are we? I don't know if this is a new question or this is in response to someone else. Uh, still looking for a fee only financial planner. I spoke to a planner that charges a few hundred dollars for an hour consultation to discuss items that I would like to, that I would like help with. Is that standard practice to charge for consultation with fee only financial planners? Uh, for better or worse, nothing is standard in the financial advisory industry. There are some folks who do pure hourly where they will only work on an hourly basis and you will pay them by the hour. There are some folks that only manage investments. There are some folks that manage investments and do planning, but only do it on an ongoing basis. They, you know, they don't do just uh, check in here, check in there stuff. So it really all depends. Um, it's uh, Pure hourly folks are not standard they're the exception not the norm but there, there are more of them popping up as the industry kind of trends away or, or client demand i should say uh kind of trends away from 
investment only or, or you know needing to manage investment advisors and, and get more towards what's called advisors or advice only or planning only advisors who don't require you to uh, uh, have them manage your assets. So sure, based on who this person is, this, this could be their model and it could be completely fine. Other folks like me, I, I stopped doing hourly like a year ago. So I, you know, I, I don't even consider taking on hourly engagements at this point. Um, so anyway. Uh, looks like the final question for now. Yeah, okay. Final question from what I see. Does an inherited IRA account work the same as a regular IRA in that you can buy and sell within the account without paying capital gains taxes? Yes. It is a qualified account just the same as a traditional IRA and that doesn't matter what happens inside the account. Taxation is only upon taking money out. Um, regardless what you have to sell inside the account to free up the cash to distribute, doesn't matter. Um, it's, you know, every dollar you take out is going to be taxed to you as ordinary income, assuming that that inherited account is all pre-tax money. It's possible there's after-tax money in there, in which case distributions would be prorated, but, but no, I'm getting off topic here. No, buying and selling within the account doesn't matter. Uh, from a tax perspective, there's, there's no capital gains tax on it. You know, you may have trading commissions um, if, if you buy and sell a lot, but otherwise there's no tax implications. Um, looks like that's the last question. Uh, Four minutes shy of nine o'clock Eastern. I'll hang out for another few minutes if anyone else has anything uh, they want to want to ask. I'm just looking if I missed other questions. Looks like these things I'm skimming over here were just people's responses to other people. Oh, I, I, I guess okay. This was probably in response to the question about do people uh, you know over seventy need a financial planner? Um. No, maybe okay. This, this might be in reference to uh, to these bond funds, I guess. All right. Um, anyone else? If not, I will wrap it up here. Let's see. Oh, hold on. New comments. Ooh, can you explain Safe Harbor? Oh, what? Huh? Sort of. I have I have a video on it. Um, I have a few videos on it about estimating withholding taxes. Long story short, is that. The U.S. income tax system is a pay-as-you-go system. You're, you're, anticip you're expected to pay taxes on income as you earn it or realize it, or at least in the quarter that you earn it or realize it. It's not that simple, but generally speaking, that, that that's the process. So, uh, for most people, you can't simply you, you can't pay no tax during the year and just wait until tax return time and pay your whole tax bill then. You you can, but if you do, there may be an underpayment penalty because again, you were you were expected and, and uh, required to have paid some amount of taxes along the way because it's pay as you go. Safe harbor simply means uh, if you pay at least X amount during the year, you will be exempt from having to worry about any underpayment penalties. So uh, the the safe harbor, there's a few, but one is so long as you pay throughout the year through withholdings or estimated payments, at least 90% of what your ultimate tax obligation for this year ends up being, you won't have any underpayment penalties. Now there's a caveat to that. The estimated payments you make have to be paid in four equal payments. Um, there's a caveat to the caveat, potentially not if you want to annualize your income. If your income's lumpy throughout the year, you can then kind of weight your, your estimated payments differently. But anyway, let's assume you have to make your estimated payments in four equal payments. Um, if you pay throughout the year at least 90% of what your ultimate obligation is, that's one safe harbor. Another one is if you pay throughout this year at least 100% of what last year's tax obligation was, uh, the, the total tax line on your form 1040, I think it was line 24 last year, then you won't have any underpayment penalties. Or if your gross income was, I think, 150 or more last year, then you have to pay 110% of last year's taxes um, to, to meet the safe harbor for this year. So the example I gave was, let's assume you had zero income last year, so you had zero tax obligation. Whether you have $1 or $100 million of income this year, your safe harbor for how much tax to have to pay throughout the year this year is zero. Because last year's tax was zero, 100% of last year's tax is still zero. So you don't have to pay any withholdings or estimated payments throughout the year this year, even if you have $2 million of income, you can pay all your tax at tax return time and not have any underpayment penalties because you met in the safe harbor. Does that make sense? Uh, whomever this was. Yes, um, 17, 23, 4, 58, 19. How many numbers am I? Is that five? Is that six? 
23, and the Powerball is 13. You're welcome. And if you win, I, I expect to pay out. I expect my share. Um, okay. Oh, hold on. Last one. And then, I, and I'll stop here. I know of a dog groomer family who went freelance in 2021 has paid no state or federal tax or uh, FICA payroll taxes, Federal Insurance Contribution Act taxes. They use Venmo. So how much hell will they be seeing soon? Um, well, a few things. Uh, is their Venmo account a business account or not? Venmo doesn't take kindly to businesses using their platform uh, unless you get a business account and, and you know they take a cut of it. But that aside, um, it depends how much income they actually made for the year. I mean, they're ultimately going to owe taxes. Well, yeah, maybe not. I mean, if their total income is, is less than the standard deduction, for example, they're not going to owe any income. Um, is that true? Yeah, I think that that'll even erase. Well, no, I take it back. Do they have employees? If they have employees, it's a whole different story. If they have employees, then they have to pay, you know, payroll taxes and those employee wages and stuff like that. But let's assume it's just, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a married couple. They're the only employees. They're, they're freelancing this, this dog grooming thing. Uh, they'll have to pay taxes, assuming they have, you know, decent amount of income. As far as the hell they'll be seeing, I, I wouldn't define it necessarily as hell. They may potentially have an underpayment penalty for not having paid taxes throughout the year, but depending how much taxes they're supposed to pay, the underpayment penalty may only be like tens of dollars, right? Even if they end up owing a few thousand bucks of, you know, ten thousand. I'm just making up a number, ten thousand bucks of taxes with their tax return their underpayment penalty is going to be a hundred bucks maybe for the year. Uh, so, you know, but if they owe hundreds of thousands of dollars of taxes and they pay nothing throughout the year, if they're a dog groomer and they, and they make that much money, good for them. But if their tax bill is a few hundred thousand bucks and they paid no taxes throughout the year, they're going to have, a, you know, a few thousand dollars of uh, uh, underpayment penalties, which isn't cool. But assuming they made, you know, 30, 40, 50, $60,000 gross income from their business, um their taxes are gonna be what i don't know i'm just making up a number 15 grand let's say under if they paid nothing throughout the year underpayment penalty is going to be um uh 50 15 grand by three 15 times i don't know it's going to be a couple hundred bucks maybe 200 dollars. just spitball on a figure so so not super punitive by any means so it all depends. All depends how much tax they should have paid but didn't. That that'll dictate how big their uh, their penalty may be. All right, um, I will wrap it there. Thank you all for joining, and thank you for this uh, momentous first tax and retirement twenty twenty two. I will not be here next week. This new schedule. Our own Cody Garrett. Uh, every second Wednesday of the month, he'll be doing his his bit. I'm excited to see what he's got. He's going to be walking you all through the inner workings of the financial planning process, where I think each month he'll be breaking down a particular area or topic or, or thing uh, he looks at when doing financial planning. So that, that should be exciting if no for no other reason than I get a break uh, one Wednesday a month. Um, so anyway, so Cody will be back next week. Um, I likely will not, but I will see you in two weeks with a special guest, Bruce Steiner. He will talk all about trusts which I know you're, you're looking forward to. He's an expert, uh, a seasoned expert in trust. He's a lawyer and a CPA, I think maybe. Uh, seasoned expert in trust and trust taxation. So for all the questions people have about, do I need a trust? What is a trust? Should I get a trust? He's the guy. So definitely looking forward to that two weeks from today. Bruce Steiner, be there or be square. All right, I'm done. Thank you all. Have a good night. Take care.